Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy blessed Sabbath. I know that many of you have been very busy this week, as have I, but I have looked forward to the hours of the Sabbath throughout the week. Now, before we begin our study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and his guidance as we open his word to understand that which he would have us to know. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day of rest. We are grateful for a day where we may remember and praise you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for your watch care through this week. We thank you for this opportunity we have to join together in spirit and in truth to study that which you are giving us from your word. Father, I pray for each one that is attending this meeting today. May we each find a blessing in all that you are doing for us. <clears throat> May we each praise you. Open our minds, open our eyes, and open our hearts to prepare us for that that you would have us to do. May your angels attend us. <clears throat> May our spirit show us that which we need so that we may draw closer to you. Direct us in this. Be with us now. We ask and we pray. And thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, we left off in this portion of Ezekiel 8, or excuse me, Hosea 8. <clears throat> and as Hosea wrote, because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be un unto him to sin. Who is Ephraim today? Who does Ephraim represent? Well, it depends on the context. I mean, it can refer to um, the Protestant world, to northern Israel. Okay, so if we make this application, and as we continue to go through this, let's see if this holds as we continue to read. I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Now, the world is becoming as fast becoming as it was before the flood. Satan has set up his throne in the earth, and the law of God is trampled underfoot. His Sabbath, sanctified and blessed in Eden, is set aside and polluted. A rival Sabbath, the first day of the week, is instituted by the man of sin, and it is ex exalted. Now, this week, as I worked and as I drove, it was interesting to me to see a post of a postal worker, a former postal worker, choosing to sue because his statement was that his Sabbath was violated. The Sabbath that he is referring to is Sunday. He is a former, po former postal worker because he was required to deliver mail on a Sunday 
and chose to quit rather than proceed as he saw to violate his conscience and as he believed the word of God. It should be interesting to see what happens with this. Now, a, com a, a comment from the chat <clears throat> that we also need to consider. Ephraim can be considered to include the people in this movement who complain about the complexity of chronology and hold on to bitterness and backbiting. Let's see how this applies as we continue to read. The sins of the inhabitants of the cities and the towns have reached to heaven, and it is time for men to pray in humility before God. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful." slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of, e of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh, sanctifying it as the day of his rest. He gave it to man as a memorial of creation, saying, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Adam's sin is repeated. What is Adam's sin referring to here? Disobedience. I don't think I, I completely understood you, brother. He said disobedience. Yes. In in what way is this disobedience? Well, the way she's saying it, it almost sounds like he didn't remember the Sabbath as well. I mean, you're reading the first part of it, and it comes down to that second part of, but Adam's, but Adam's sin is repeated. She says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it whole, but Adam's sin is repeated. So it, is it the sin that he didn't listen to God, or is it the sin that he broke one, he broke them all? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Okay. Adam chose to join with his wife in transgression because <clears throat> he chose to accept the word of our adversary over the word of God. Any time that we place man's word over the word of God, are we not then sinning in a similar manner to Adam? Indeed, but I'm thinking it's not so much that he put God's word, of, I mean, man's word above God's is because he didn't want to see his wife ruined ruin and annihilated. And so he decided to compromise with her. I, I, I 
I remember reading that he, he was horrified when he found out that she'd sinned. But because of his great love for her, which surpassed his love for God, he decided to transgress with her. So can we say that Adam placed his love for his wife then above his duty to God? Amen. Is this not the same type of sin that we are seeing that's existing currently within the world and within the church? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You're seeing the um, the woman, the state, or the church, I mean, um, having rule over the state. Right. And that's that's Adam's sin, right? Yes. As we, as we determine it? Correct. The Sabbath of the Lord is discarded and scorned, while a spurious Sabbath, the child of the papacy, is accepted by the Protestant world and is cherished and exalted as supreme. But it has not a vestige of sacredness any more than has any common working day. Set the trumpet to thy mouth, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and tra trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold, they have made them idols, that they may be cut off. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Hosea 8, 1 to 4, and verse 12. How true this is today. Laws enacted by finite authority are exalted above the law of Jehovah. Laws enacted by the creation are exalted above the law of the creator. Is this thought showing us how upside down this entire situation is? Men trample underfoot God's holy law and say of God's people, as the Jews said of Christ, we have a law and by our law, he ought to die. John 19, 7. Over and over again, this will be repeated in the courts. Christ tells us in the world, we shall have tribulation, but that in him, we shall have peace. John 16, 33. Those who live in the last days of this world's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. Injustice will prevail in the courts. Judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal and are true to the commandments of God and will say, we have a law and by our law, he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law for and with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored. <clears throat> but those who will not bow to the idle Sabbath have no favors shown to them. Those by whom they are tried utterly refuse to listen to their reasons because they know that arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. All that is brought against the validity of the fourth commandment is of human invention. There is not one word in the Bible that sustains the first day of the week. It is a spurious Sabbath, baptized by human enactment and given to the world to be kept holy. And false though it is, the world cherishes it, thus pursuing a blasphemous course.
Hear the word spoken by Christ when enshrouded in the pillar of cloud and given to Moses for the chosen people of God. You know, it, it is very surprising when you begin to consider certain points. Here, Mrs. White is very clear that it was Christ who was enshrouded in the pillar of cloud. In a conversation I had yesterday, we were going over a point because there are many today that claim themselves to be New Testament Christians. They claim that the New Testament contains everything that they need to more fully understand Christ, and then they can fully set aside the Old Testament. Yet, at the time of Christ's temptation and battle directly with the adversary after he had been baptized that we find in Matthew chapter 4 as well as finding in Mark and in Luke how did Christ confront the claims of the adversary uh, search the scriptures or God's word says thus saith the Lord Right? Yeah, right. Thus saith the Lord. And when he is giving a thus saith the Lord, is he not referring to specific passages within the Old Testament? Yes. There's numerous occasions. So in this situation, as he refers to this in the Old Testament, is he not offering testimony that we need both the Old Testament and the New Testament to be able to stand in our lot today. Yes. I mean, well, but they're having an issue with um, searching the scriptures. They can't. That's what he does. He places his approval on the scriptures at that point. In, in several points throughout the scriptures, he says this. Right. He places his approval upon yeah. the entire scriptures. That's right. Yeah, um, yesterday, when I was searching the nature of man out, uh, many of the people that post anything about the nature of Christ are um, questions are posed. Uh, this one was one that I heard, I've seen a, a few times, which was, um, did Christ exist before um, he was born? And uh, the typical answer is no, which it's, to me, it's, that's a foolish statement. I mean, because who was in the burning bush? Who was inside the pillar of cloud? Who was the, who was Michael, you know? Um, who was it? Who was it that came to Gideon? Right. <laughs> who came to Samson's parents? Right. Who is that angel of the Lord? They haven't put it together yet, or won't accept it. One of the two. Right. So many times, we are confronted by this in the midst of the church today. And it's sad that those within the church wish to set aside that which Christ has done in ages past for the patriarchs. Okay, we have a comment in the chat that says Genesis 9.13, <clears throat> Exodus 13.21, and 16.10. Why? The reason I put those up is because they're just a few verses proving that Christ's glory and his rainbow, which encircles his head or his throne, appears in the cloud. And okay. there are many more verses like that. 
Thank you. As a token of a covenant between God and the earth. Amen. So, so that covenant can... is everlasting. Yes, it is. <clears throat> and as we continue in our studies, we should see more each time of the importance of what is to be our covenant with God, with Jehovah, and the need of the change within our characters. For as this is written, thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord the God, the God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he hath sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and released you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and that keepeth commandment to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, to will repay him to his face. Thou therefore shalt keep the commandments, and the statutes, and the judgments, which I command thee this day to do them. Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11. If your heart was filled with goodness and mercy, your words would have an altogether different effect. You would not hurt and destroy, but would engage in the work of healing. When we are seeing those that are spreading gossip, that are tearing down, that are lifting themselves up above others. Their heart is not filled with goodness and mercy. They are choosing to hurt and destroy and not to engage in the work of healing. Again, I say, become a Bible Christian. Instead of putting yokes on the necks of others, break every yoke. Humble yourself before God. He says, for I have desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Lord declares, but like they like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against who? Against me. If we are choosing to gossip, if we are choosing to tear down, if we are choosing to hurt others, cast, casting suspicion upon others, who is this ultimately being done to? Yeah, for the creator what is this saying to us today as we continue to read by self uh, you think your brain's so big but it's not <laughs> exactly <laughs> by selfish dealing a work has been done that is entirely contrary to the character of god entirely opposed to his law. This is something so fearful for us to have to consider. How some could be preaching the word of God 
but yet being completely opposed to the character of God. Is that where we want to be standing at this day, at this time? So actually, that's why I've, I've left several churches was because there was no love in them. I mean, they were talking it, about it. They were talking the talk, but they weren't walking the walk. And exactly. I, I was in such a bad way that um, I felt like I would be influenced more and more to the wrong. So I had to get away from it. I understand. Love to God and love to man are the two great principles of this law. But the law has been perverted by men professing to serve God and treacherous dealing has come in. Men are not to rob the work in one part of the vineyard in order to build up the work that they are handling. The work in all parts of the vineyard is to be multiple, right? No, one. It's to be one. We are all to work together in unity. Each worker is to do all in his power to build up every interest in every part of the field. Brothers and sisters, there's been many times as we have been going through these studies in the book of Judges, in chronology, using and, and trying to understand the various numbers that we're seeing. I keep being asked, can't you make this simpler? Can't you, can't you just go out and, and preach nothing but the love of Christ? How can we do this and yet ignore Palmoni? Well, it depends on your version of love, bro. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, um, is all that fuzziness? Because, you know, every word that I've read in the Bible doesn't leave me, giving me a fuzzy feeling. It's given me a feeling that uh, 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 condemnation. Okay. Kind of a gut punch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more of a more of a right in the side of the head <laughs> punch. You know. There's there's been many times that, as I have been reading, as I have been studying, that some of these concepts have come to me very much like a two by four upside the head. Right. Yet, in many of the churches that I have visited, <clears throat> I don't find those that are willing or able to truly want to study. We find too many times that people are more willing to be reliant upon their pastor to tell them what the Bible says than to study for themselves. But bro, I, I'm, I'm too busy working. I, I haven't got time. Yet, what does it say? What, what has Paul said is it not that we are to study to show thyself approved unto God? Right? I mean, everybody forgets that stuff. But is thyself in the plural or is this in the singular? Well, thyself is singular. Right. And again, I believe the quote in the chat is Philippians 1, 15 to 18. Or is that Philemon? No, no. It's it's a Philippians, but you know, when you were talking about that Christ of contention or contentiousness or pablum love. These verses came to my mind. It says, some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, 
and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. This is when Paul was in prison. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding, <clears throat> every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So I'm thinking that's probably why God has uh, tolerated, it, so to speak, the church for so long, because even though their actions belie their words, at least the gospel is preached somewhat. Right. Are we to rely upon any man or organization to tell us how to study or what to believe? We're not supposed to. The moment that we do, are we then placing that man or that organization between us and God? Yeah. You're looking for a buffer. And yet, who is our intercessor? Christ. So we are to have faith in the words that Christ has given us, and we are to have faith in Christ alone. Is that not true? Correct. Men have shown that they cannot be trusted to handle the means raised from God's people to do a certain work for him. The Lord declares that a change must come. He says to those in responsible positions, I will be with you no more unless you set things in order. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and of their gold, have they made them idols, that they may be cut off? I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Hosea 8, 1 to 4, and verse 12. The law of God is seen as a strange thing today because men choose to accept the wisdom of other men rather than a plain thus saith the Lord. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities. And thy judges of whom thou settest, give me a king and princes. Hosea 13, 9 and 10. Thus things have been managed among the people of God. <clears throat> a few men have had the power of control over all of the world. But they have not voiced the words of God. What a direct statement is this. What a fearful pronouncement are we reading at this time. They have followed their own judgment. Are we to set ourselves up as arbiters of the word of God? No.
In God's cause, there are to be no kings. A few men are not to control the work in all the parts of the world. God is to be the director and the king of his people. Man is but man. He is not God. And when he strives to dictate and control, he brings upon himself the displeasure of heaven. When God's voice is heard, mercy and truth will meet together. All alienation and strife will disappear. All oppression will cease. The, the date um, is interesting because she was going over and over after 88 um, the the problems with the the men in power right she kept talking about that never never actually bear, wavering at all and they continue to do what they did they wouldn't they wouldn't bring in the words of god they hear it but they're just not doing it, it then it's my way or the highway at that point. Is that not setting up idols? Oh, yeah. Do we still the real see? Biggest, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. The biggest issue for me is, is how come they don't see it? Or how come we don't see it? Because I have to include myself with that. Because there's a lot of times that I do, uh, you know, stupid things. <laughs> okay. To say the least. Um, but it's more of a, you know, in habit. And as soon as I do it, it's, it's regretted instantly, you know, but I still do this stuff. It, but again, it's still habit. Um, I'm working on that, you know, getting away from that. It's, it's really hard to do. Sister White even had a testimony about that, about how hard it is to reverse that course. Before us is part of what we read last week. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein there is no pleasure. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. Does this not give at least a partial answer to your question? Why can they not see this? Because they are swallowed up. They are now among the Gentiles. And they have hired lovers. Okay, down from the chat, Proverbs 23, 29 to 33. What can we draw Going back to contentions? <clears throat> well, excuse me, my throat is really clogged. Um, <clears throat> who has woe? Who hath sorrow? <clears throat> excuse me. Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? All of these arguments over doctrines and what have you. Who has wounds without cause? Well, they do have a cause. They just don't perceive them, right? Who hath I... redness of eye? They that tarry long at the wine doctrines of men they that go to seek mixed wine ecumenism everything the papacy is putting out the woke movement soji one two three with the transsexualism and all this garbage look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth its color in the cup when it moveth itself aright at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder thine eyes shall behold strange women strange churches following strange doctrines and thine heart shall utter perverse things so this is coming from the heart it's so deeply ingrained we have so much to unlearn <clears throat> and also there's part of the vatican i think it's one of their major meeting places its architecture is designed in the form of a viper that is really startling and vatican means to prophesy by the serpent Interesting. Now, further post is, has been made in the chat. 
This week, a pastor said that in 1914, the spirit of prophecy said that the Lord separated and divorced himself from the general Seventh-day Adventist church. And now out of that is the re remnant reformed Seventh-day Adventist that has absolutely nothing to do with the Seventh-day Adventist church. I told him that his belief is error and not according to the scripture and according to Revelation 10. I don't know that I've seen this quote from the spirit of prophecy. If you come up with it, um, please favor us with the direct quote so that this. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. That would be nice. Now. We are seeing today that each worker is not doing all in their power to build up every interest in every part of the field. Currently, we, are, we have so many that are battling against numbers, against chronology, against, against things. Against each other? Against each other, yes. Men have shown that they cannot be trusted to handle the means raised from God's people to do a certain work for him. The Lord declares that a change must come. He says to those in responsible positions, I will be with you no more unless you set things in order. Again, we repeat Hosea 8, 1 to 4 and verse 12. Thus things have been managed among the people of God. A few men have had the power of control over all of the work, but they have not voiced the words of God. They have followed their own judgment. In God's cause, there are to be no kings. A few men are not to control the work in all parts of the world. God is to be the director and the king of his people. Man is but man. He is not God. And when he strives to dictate and control, he brings upon himself the displeasure of heaven. When God's voice is heard, mercy and truth will meet together. All alienation and strife will disappear. All oppression will cease. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is the word of God. God's word is fulfilled because God can make his word known. The word imparts power, it begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. The life thus imparted is in like manner sustained by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. Here is, quote, the reference used in Matthew chapter 4 when Christ stood against our adversary. We are being told by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, man is to live. Does that mean if we disagree with specific portions of scripture or specific passages of the spirit of prophecy that we are to say, well, I don't really need this in my life. This can be set aside. 
are we to pick and choose what passages we are to accept and those that we can safely reject? Negative. There's no safety in rejection. There is no safety in rejection is ever so true. There are many portions of the spirit of prophecy that when I run across them, I, I had yet not considered them. Every time I study like this, if I find things that I have not heard before, I will look to study them, ask questions about them to see how this is to have an impact within my life. The mind, the soul is built upon that which it feeds. And it rests with us to determine upon what it shall be fed. It is within the power of everyone to choose the topics that shall occupy the thoughts and shape the character. Whose power? Everyone's power. Does this mean that man can say, I don't have the power to do what the scripture says it's telling us to encourage that, that individual exactly of every human being privileged with access to the scriptures god says i have written to him the great things of my law call unto me and i will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Every human being has access to the scriptures. Well, it says of every human being privileged with access to the scriptures. But in okay. her time, you know, not everybody had a Bible. Today, everybody has two. Three. As I was returning from meetings in Portland, Oregon this week, I was asked to take a break and stop at a Bible bookstore. One of the things that was interesting to me is in this Bible bookstore, they have a, a cheat sheet addressing the different versions of the Bible. What they had on this cheat sheet referenced the King James. Each of the versions was, was graded as to what kind of a education you would need to understand the different versions. The Education stated necessary to read and understand the King James was a high school graduate or above because the language is so difficult, so flowery, so hard to read that for a person to read and truly understand the Bible, that they would be better to take an English standard version, a living translation, or other paraphrase, rather than to accept the King James. It's interesting for me because there are so many that would rather have a steady diet of the milk than ever attempt to enjoy the meat of the word. I tried going to a, a, a light Bible 
<laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it didn't have any flavor. Right. Uh, it didn't fill me up. Um, and, and I actually found um, a lot of disagreement um, with, let's just say, for example, the new King James over the uh, the approved King James first. Right. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of disparity between it. Um, but it's people that were dissatisfied with that old language and didn't have the wherewithal to, to, to look up the words and see what they mean. You know, uh, they, it didn't, it didn't talk to them per se, but I've, I haven't had any trouble. I've, I started with the King James, went to the NIV, went to the, um, uh, the new King James, and then back again to the, the King James again. But this was, you know, 30, 40 years ago almost. It was just a, a, a terrible diet. I, I lost weight and I, I couldn't, I, I just, I was hungry all the time. I understand your pain, but I appreciate what you're saying, what your testimony is. Again, in the chat, we're given the reference to look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That following the verse, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The promises of God, the blessings of God are conditional. If we are willing to follow God implicitly, honoring his word, understanding the word as it is written, then the blessings will happen. The blessings will come. But if we are not accepting of the blessings, then what happens? Well, nothing. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be funny about this, but uh, if you don't accept it, nothing's going to happen. Those if things that we just talked about, you know, the things you just talked about won't happen. If we were to read again with Leviticus 25 and 26, Leviticus being the letter written for the Levites today. We are shown the blessings and the curses that happen. Blessings if we honor the word of God. Curses if we choose not to honor the word of God. But some will just continue on. And not see that those curses that they're getting to be curses. They don't right? even understand them. Many, many, many people don't just can't understand it because they they don't choose to study it. I agreed. The Israelites were about to possess a land where idolatry had reigned supreme, and they were warned not to follow after the gods of the heathen. Take ye good heed unto yourself was the counsel given. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, unless you lift up thine eyes unto the heaven when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and to serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided 
unto all nations under the whole heaven. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything, which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Moses was inspired to utter a prophecy outlining the sure result of apostasy. Moses was inspired to utter this prophecy to show the blessings of obedience and the curses of disobedience. Plainly, he traced the evils that would result from a departure from the statutes of Jehovah. Calling heaven and earth to witness against the people, he declared if, after having dwelt long in the land of promise, they should introduce things which thine eyes have seen, and to graven images, and should refuse to return to the worship of the true God, the anger of the Lord would be aroused. And they would be carried away captive and scattered among the heathen. Ye shall soon utterly perish, he warned them, from off the land whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. The prophecy fulfilled in part in the time of the judges of Israel met a more complete and terrible fulfillment in the captivity of Israel in Assyria and of Judah in Babylon. Have we not been studying the fulfillment of these prophecies as we have studied the book of Judges? Yeah. As we, go ahead. Yeah, I thought you were asking a question. I've answered, yes. Okay. But is this not showing us the need that is required of us today? Well, well yeah. During the passing centuries, from generation to generation, Satan made repeated attempts to cause Israel to forget the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, Deuteronomy 6.1, that they had promised to keep forever. For he knew that if he could only lead Israel to forget God and to walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, the chosen nation would surely perish. Deuteronomy 8.19 But the enemy of all souls had not taken into account the long-suffering of him who will by no means clear the guilty, yet whose glory is to be merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgression and sin, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Despite the efforts of Satan to thwart God's purpose for his chosen people, and even in some of the darkest hours of Israel's history, when it seemed as if the forces of evil were about to gain the victory, the Lord graciously revealed himself. He spread before Israel the things that were for their welfare as a nation. I have written to him the great things of my law, he declared, of Israel through Hosea, but they were counted as a strange thing, Hosea 8.12. I taught Ephraim also to go 
he declared by taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. Hosea 11.3 Tenderly the Lord dealt with them, instructing them by his prophets, line upon line and precept upon precept. Here we have a situation. As Israel and Judah had turned aside from God. As they set up altars. As they set up their idols. As they listened to their great men. Their wonderful teachers. Did they not also worship other than God and treat the law as something to be counted as a strange thing? Are we not seeing this done today? Yes. Sad, isn't it? Yes. Okay, the comment in the chat. Part of the problem with the church and anyone reading the New King James Version, which is sold by the ABC, or had been, is that it does away with the truth that Christ entered into the holy, the first apartment, and not the most holy, the second apartment, of the heavenly sanctuary at his return to heaven. So from this springs the everything is fulfilled at the cross, our sins are nailed to the tree, and we're no longer accountable doctrine and the sloppy agape and sloppy lives that we see. I almost have to wonder if it doesn't go further than that. Well, all the new translations translate Hebrews 9.12 as Christ entered into the most holy place. So how do they set this aside? Well, the way they did this, because um, I used to own the, the translator's Bible, which is used by the Wycliffe Bible translators. Okay. So what they said is even though it says holy place in the Greek, we 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 will translate it as most holy place. They don't give a reason other than that that's how they interpret the, the text. So it's quite clear in the Hebrew that it's not referring to the most holy place, or the Greek, I mean, that it's referring to the holy place, but they translate it as most holy place or holy of holies. So it's an interpretive translation. Okay. So from, from the way that we should look at this in, in this part of the study, we are aware as we have, as we had studied in this last week, that when Christ stands up, there is a change that occurs. In New Testament times, after his return to the heavenly courts, when did Christ first stand up? Can you give that question again, please? That would be at, that would be at the death of Stephen in thirty four AD. So if Christ stood up after his return to the heavenly courts and he stood up first at the death of Stephen, at the stoning of Stephen, does this not symbolize 
the ending of the 70th week of Daniel 9. Well, yes, that's how we that's how we take it. It's the last three and a half weeks to the seven weeks. I mean, yeah, the last okay. three days, three and a half days of the seven days. So when he is then standing at this point, since this portion of the 2300 days, this, four, this time period of 490 years, or as I, as I have been presenting, this period of probation for the nation of Israel, Now that this is completed, does Christ not now assume his role and begin ministering within the holy place of the heavenly courts? Um, it, it makes sense. Now, in one of the passages that we had read last week, Mrs. White was given a vision where God the Father, Jehovah, was to have his throne moved into the most holy. And did Christ, our high priest, not follow him into the most holy at that time? He did. Now, did we not see this applied to the events of and after October 22nd, 1844. So my ultimate question would be, is this not again Christ standing up and a change of his work? beginning to occur. Amen. So yes. we have progressed then in the book of Acts when he stood up at the stoning of Stephen. The time of probation for the Jews as a nation was ended. Yes. And for the balance of the 2300 days, 1810 years, a number, chronology again, we have Christ as our priest ministering within the holy place after this when God's throne was moved and Christ followed them what were the actions that occurred in the holy place and then in the most holy I, I don't quite understand your question Okay. What we read last week was Mrs. White had seen that there were those that followed Christ into the most holy. Uh, and then the, but there was a residual that sat there and Satan got in front of them. They no, didn't notice the change. Right. All of this right now is necessary for us to keep in mind. 
because when Christ stood up at the stoning of Stephen, this was representing to us a change in his ministry. When the most the when the great disappointment came upon the Millerites, there was a further change in Christ's ministry. Those, okay, those that were watching carefully, that chose to study, that chose to accept God's word just as it reads, that did not expect a man to explain the scriptures to them, they followed Christ into the most holy. Yes. Those that sought the scriptures to be explained by others remained without. And who was it that continued to speak to them? Was it not our adversary? Um, yes. Uh, Lucifer or Satan or whatever name you choose to give to him. Adversary is good. Today, we are given the admonition. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Had Israel taken the messages of the prophets emphasizing the value of the great things of God's law, they would have been spared the humiliation that followed. It was because they persisted in turning aside from his law that God was compelled to allow their enemies to take them captive. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, was his message to them through Hosea. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God. In trial and affliction, they were to learn lessons that under circumstances more favorable, they had refused to learn. Are we not told by Sister White that the presentation of the gospel message will become more difficult in the time when men are seeking to lift up a common work day in place of the Sabbath. Oh, oh yeah. Paraphrase, but yes. Can we then apply this statement that in trial and affliction, they were to learn lessons that under circumstances more favorable they had refused to learn can we apply that to the movement today um well that's who it was written for i mean it was more for us than for them that it was written for in every yeah. age transgressions of god's law have been accompanied by the same result does god change negative so then, this statement for us is that if we fail to learn the lessons of the past, we, are re we will be repeating the mistakes. Yeah, Santana, yeah. In the days of Noah, when every precept of this law was set aside, Iniquity became so deep and widespread that God could no longer bear with it. And he said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Solomon said, there is no new thing under the sun. In the time of Abraham, the people of Sodom openly defied God and his law, and there followed the same wickedness, the same corruption, the same unbridled indulgence that had marked the antediluvian world. The inhabitants of Solomon passed the limits of divine forbearance, 
and there were kindled against them the fires of God's vengeance. The time preceding the downfall of the northern kingdom was one of similar disobedience and of similar wickedness. God's law was counted as a thing of naught, as something not to be listened to. And this opened the floodgates of iniquity upon Israel. Are we not seeing these same floodgates opened again in the world today? Yes. The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, Hosea declared, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Hosea 8.13 They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepted them not. Nor Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins, they shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his maker, and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. It is a hard thing to say for the Israel of today hath forgotten his creator and has chosen to build temples. Yet God has stated, I will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour the palaces thereof. What was being said was going to happen to Nashville? What was the, the Nashville prophecy? Was it not a warning that the patience of God has been exceeded and that we need to prepare that the creator of this earth is soon to come to take vengeance upon those that have set aside his law? Well, that was the motivation. Now, in the chat, the comment is made. I noticed this passage from Review and Herald was published 108 years minus 10 days from the date Theodore's Zoom link and studies were dropped from the Three Angels message notifications. So refer referring to this passage from Review and Herald, right? 26th of February, 1914. Right. Again, how many more symbols, how many more warnings and admonitions do we need to have presented before us before we wake up and accept what God is saying to us? How many more times do we need to be hit upside the head with a two by four before we are willing to accept that we are in a time where we need to draw together to give a message to the that the Almighty wants given to this world. But first, that message is to go to the church, 
that message is to go to the ancients of the house of God and then is to proceed throughout Israel. So, uh, but how can that message go out um, without a change of heart? From Agreed. The movement. How can it? It, it won't until that obstacle is uh, overcome. What are we to do if we have a message to give and others wish to fight against it? Well, um, just continue to give the message, I would imagine. I mean, it didn't stop anybody until they were put into prison or and even then it probably didn't stop the message it just stopped people from hearing the message i don't i don't have an answer okay i believe this message this, especially this verse, Hosea 8.14, has been greatly overlooked and greatly set aside by all of those that would highly criticize the message that was being given on July 18th of 2020. It is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to hear the trumpet's call. There will be those that will join. There will be those that will accept the message. And there will be those that will continue to kneel and pray in front of the adversary And be willing to say that what's come from the adversary is of God. And this is not something that we should take lightly. Any other comments or thoughts or questions at this time? So I let my sister read um, the Mary conundrum. Yes. And uh, she liked it. But her comment to me was, um, well, let me see what it said. I'll... <laughs> um, I don't put as much faith in the words of prophets as I do in my own interpretations of scripture. I like the new King James a lot. And I like prophets like Hildegard of Bingen, Julian of Norwich, Rainier Reich, Evelyn Underhill, Pierre de Cardin, and Thomas Merton, to name just a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my question to her was, well, when you use the word prophet, what do you mean? Uh, I use great care on who I call a prophet. When I use the word prophet, which means inspired, I understand that there are two types of prophets in the scriptures, true and false. Right. Do you, do you know how to tell the difference between them? The Bible is very clear on the subject. And her response to me was, uh, let me chew on the question. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene is a book available on Amazon. Okay, because I didn't know what she was saying to me. She asked me about, have I? what do I think about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Like I read it or something. I didn't know what she was talking about. So that's what it was. But um, she's going to chew on the question. Hmm. That's my sister. Interesting. She's, a, uh, she's got the highest rank in, a, in, in the Catholic Church uh, for a woman. 
I can see why she sounds like my mother. <laughs> okay. It sounds like you're going to have some very interesting conversations coming up. Uh, well, this is this is the uh, in and over a well. It's been quite a long time since we've conversed in this manner. It kind of stopped um, uh, <laughs> when she asked me um, about uh, inspired books and. Uh, I, I basically posed that same question to her. <laughs> okay. You know, there's true and there's false. And how do you, how do you determine what's false and what's true? And it just kind of petered out after that. That was right after my mother had died. Um, and she was, she was there at the house to help take care of um, the last things that needed to be done. Right. After she had died. Yeah. We, we have a casual conversations every now and then, but it's, you know, uh, when they start getting deep, I got to go is her, <laughs> her, her standard, uh, you know, cop out, basically. I, I haven't called her on it, you know, and I'm trying not to. Um, right. I'm trying to take a, a, a different approach um, than I used to because I used to be, well, is that so uh, and, well, I said this, and I mean, I, I read this, and I read that. It was kind of, you know, not not very productive and not very fruitful. Got it. <laughs> the problem with Catholics is that, as a former Catholic, I was taught, too, that whatever the fathers of the church said, it's above what the Word of God said. It's above the Bible. And this is the problem we're going to have to face. They are so indoctrinated with this killing faith. Like it, it, it just destroys, it's meant to destroy any questioning of papal doctrines, although they change from distances, papal in six, the, 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 the statements of the popes or whatever. I mean, it's, it's just mass confusion absolute mass confusion and it's uh, i went through this with my catholic relatives too and you know well if my merits exceed my sins then i'll be able to escape purgatory or early and enter heaven and i mean there's nothing it's not christian it is not a christian religion how they many of to... your family actually reads the bible they probably well, don't. my kids <laughs> most of my kids have nothing to do with Christ. I mean, I'm praying for them all the time, but I mean, I tried to teach them Protestant theology, right? But unfortunately, I was a hypocrite. I didn't live it. I turned them off. And so I'm praying that, Lord, you put someone else in their lives that can lead them to you. You you send your angels to enlighten their darkened minds. And I take a lot of blame for the way my kids have turned up. But I tell them, you are adults now. You are willing. You have to be willing to make a choice. And I said, I believe, and I still believe this. I believed it since I was 15 years old, that anyone who is fervently, consistently seeking the truth will come to the truth. It might take years and might take decades, but that person will come to the truth if he or she is fervently seeking it as I was. I and this is a faith that we have to have for our kids. It doesn't matter if, 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 if they worship Satan and one of my kids almost does, one of them proclaims she's a white witch. I mean, it's just, I have such a medley of people that I'm dealing with, right? And all I can do is say, uh, you are loved. You are loved by, by one who creates and redeems and recreates, even though you don't know it. Well, well you know, most people see that as, a, as, a, as a, the great, uh, you know, um, justice system. <laughs> You know, it, 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 he's he's so heavy handed and they don't see that all the years that he's allowed this stuff to go on as being compassionate. <laughs> yeah, amazing long suffering. OK. Now we are coming to the end of our, our time together today. So now we're going to need to close with prayer. And there's going to be some things that we're going to need to look to address this coming week.
Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We spent, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we've had to examine your word, to understand that if we set man in place of your scripture, that we are no better than those that have set up idols of wood, of stone, or of metal. Help us today, guide us in all things, so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, and to rest completely in the promises of your word. For this, Father, we thank you, and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.